The goal of data visualization is to clearly and effectively communicate the most important information about the data set. And one of the finest books written on this topic is The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Dr. Edward Tufte. This is a book that I happen to have on my own bookshelf because a friend of mine and myself flew down to Dallas, Texas, in which we got to listen to Dr. Tufte present on graphical displays of quantitative information, and we got a stack of free books, because that is what nerdy statistician types like me do for fun. In this book, Dr. Tufte describes the qualities of what he calls graphical excellence. What is it that makes one graph particularly good? And on page 13, Dr. Tufte answers this question, saying that graphics reveal data. The whole point of creating graphics, descriptive statistics for our variables, is so that we can reveal what the data actually show. What then are the qualities of graphical excellence? First, most important, number one is that our graphs should display our data honestly. We want to reveal what the data actually show. We don't predetermine the outcome that we want to see and then cherry pick the data and present it in a specific way that leads us to this outcome that we wish were true. We want to let the data speak for themselves. We want to show what the data actually reveal in their totality. The second quality of graphical excellence that Dr. Tufte describes is that graphics reveal data without distortion. You may recall when we were talking about pie charts, I showed you an example of a 3D pie chart in Microsoft Excel and very clearly illustrated how the three-dimensional pie chart distorts the data, making Pie, pie slices that are the same size appear larger or smaller because of the way that that graph has been twisted in space. This is another reason why we don't use pie charts if we have a better option available. Excellent graphics reveal data with a focus on substance rather than chart junk. Now I appreciate a good looking chart as much as the next guy. But no one is that impressed by how pretty you make your chart. I'm not reading journal articles in order to see pretty charts. I'm reading them to see what the data reveal. So using chart junk, additional colors and three-dimensional objects and things which just clutter up the chart is unnecessary and unhelpful. Excellent graphics synopsize large amounts of data into a tidy summary. In the future, I'm going to give you a data set which has 4,000 or more data points. And we're going to create a display of that data that reveals a pattern within that data that I hope at that time will say something profound to you. You can remember that is the length of stay in ICU patients data set. So when we get there, You'll see that display of data. 4,000 data points boiled down into a clean display that reveals something important about the shape of the data. Excellent graphics support the text description. If you are including information in the text, that same information does not need to be duplicated in a table or a graph. However, you can create a graph or a table to display a larger amount of information, and then the text should support the information that we see in the graph. In other words, the graph, the table, the text should all be telling us the same thing. We might have more information in a table, more information still in a graph, and the text clarifies the most important parts of our distribution. Excellent graphs stimulate thought comparisons, and understanding. When graphing is done well, it causes you to think. It causes you to make comparisons. It allows you to learn something that you didn't know before and apply that in your life. 
Let me see if I can illustrate this using an example of some data that I analyzed several years back. The data that I was asked to analyze concerned abstinence-based sex education. There are two general approaches to sex education in America, a comprehensive approach that teaches students about themselves and their bodies, their sexuality, and helps them to make good choices and stay safe. The abstinence-based approach says focus only on not having sex or being abstinent. So it's sex education without the sex or the education. The question, however, is does it work? And so I was asked to analyze some data about a program. I was immediately interested in what has already been done, what has already been learned about the program, and what claims are being made about its efficacy. This is a chart based upon information that was contained in the promotional literature for this program. The program was called Choosing the Best, and the program advertised that students who received Choosing the Best were nearly 1.5 times more likely to delay the onset of sexual behavior than the control students at the end of ninth grade. The graph that you see here is not the original graph, but I recreated it using that original graph so that it appears exactly as it did in the literature with the exception of the colors that I've added for clarity. What we see is that the blue bar representing the outcome for choosing the best is indeed much taller than the green bar representing the control students, which would indicate that in fact the program is very effective. However, I said that the purpose of excellent graphing was to cause you to think. And as I look at this graph, I see some things that could be done better. Let me point out to you what I think might be some flaws in this graph. The first is that the y-axis is not anchored at zero. Always be suspicious of bar charts that do not anchor the y-axis at zero. Yes, there may be some exceptions to this. However, generally, not anchoring a y-axis at zero is an excellent way to exaggerate differences that exist within the bar chart. In this example, we see that the numbers run from 61 to 67 percent. What would that look like if we were looking at zero to 100 percent? The second thing I noticed is that although the advertising says that students who received Choosing the Best were 1.5 times more likely to delay, the blue bar is 2.5 times taller than the green bar. This is a distortion of the data. In fact, I created a second, shorter bar which would represent a true 1.5 difference. And the third point that I see here is that only post-test data are included in this bar chart. There's no pre-test and there's no follow-up. So why does that matter? Why do we want to see both the beginning and the ending numbers? Let me see if I can illustrate that for you using stats blocks. Here we have two groups. This is group number one. And this is group number two. This is the pre-test. This is the post-test. If this group is ineffective. So let's say that we're measuring weight loss and this group has zero weight loss from pretest to post-test. What we'll see is a flat line indicating no change over time. However, this second group is using an approach that is very effective. What we should see is a decrease over time in that second group. When we see the non-parallel lines in our bar chart, they start at the same place, one ends lower. That is called an interaction. That indicates change over time. Furthermore, it indicates that this group is changing better than this second group. Upon seeing what I think are limitations in this display of data, the only thing to do is to go back to the original data and create bar charts that I think more accurately display the numbers. And here's what I came up with. The first fix that you will notice is that these percentages are now on a y-axis that runs from 0% to 100%. And where is this 1.5 time difference? It's right here. 
That is the difference when we put it in context. What we can now see is that the 1.5 times claim is referring only to the gap between the bars, not the overall bar height. So now let's add that pre post follow up component. Following the trend from pre test through post test to follow up, we see two parallel lines and they're both going down. And down is the opposite of success when you're trying to maintain a steady number. What's also not revealed in the claim, but which I determined from reading the actual report is that these are both abstinence based education programs. So what we are really learning from this data set and display of information is that both of these abstinence programs fail at exactly the same rate. I said that a quality of excellent graphing was causing you to think. Have I caused you to think? Have I helped you to make comparisons? Do you know something more than you did just a few minutes ago? If so, I feel like I've done my job in illustrating excellent graphing. So let me wrap up this video by discussing best practices for graphical excellence. When you create any kind of graph, you should give it a title and that title should be clear and concise, probably referring to the variables displayed in the graph. You should have an X and Y axis and each axis should be clearly labeled and show the units of measure. If you're using bar charts, it is advisable to anchor your Y axis at zero. APA style says not to use colors. If you're using colors for any reason, be sure that those are clean and distinct that reveal the data. If you are working on a publication, use gray scale. I typically avoid fill patterns, but when they are necessary, APA style calls for them to be distinct patterns that are easily recognizable from the legend to the actual information contained in your graph. The legend should contain all of the categories, the colors, the patterns that are contained within the graph itself, and the overall presentation should be simple and clean. And now you know how to present your data better, and hopefully you can follow these ideas to improve your graphical excellence.